So who is Jeff Immlett and why do you care what he's written a book about? Well, you probably don't want to read his book, but he's got a lot of good learning to share on leadership as he was a CEO of General Electric GE. Hi Booktube, I'm Chris, I'm a doctor in the UK. I'll save you the trouble of reading this book by summarising the key points for you. Now I didn't know GE was actually originally founded in 1892 by Thomas Edison, that famous inventor that you'll have heard about. GE is a massive operating conglomerate and one of the challenges of leading a conglomerate is its complexity and Jeff tried to simplify this because conglomerate isn't just a really difficult word to say. It means that there's many different parts, deputies, businesses within one organization internationally that are trying to work together. It becomes very complicated. So how can you get the best out of complexity without being just unnecessarily complex? The best leaders actually absorb fear. They're not only giving people the truth, but they're also giving them that path forward. Transparency, this is an admiral goal but the real goal as a leader is actually to solve problems. It is important, it's often easier to know what to do than when to do it. That's important because timing is everything. A leader, as a leader that you are, you cannot be indecisive. There's nothing more frustrating if you're a team member and your leader is kind of voicing out loud reasons why they're not acting, citing these as cautions and kind of dithering about and not performing action. This could cause the whole business to fail. Making imperfect decisions in the pursuit of progress is always going to beat the alternative, which is letting the fear of blame stop you from taking action. In a crisis, you'll have two different splits of people. One lot will go about pointing fingers. The other will rally and try and solve problems. And arguably, there's very minimal overlap between these two groups of people. Because in the blaming culture, people stop actually working just to cover themselves. Whereas a good team member will stand alongside you. And that's the marker of a good strong team in which you can get through any crisis. And in a crisis, leaders must fight for their company's reputations. Your colleagues will feel well respected when you understand what they actually do. If you can foster mutual accountability, that's a good target. And what Jeff said he did, he went about meeting team members i.e. heads of department from different um, organizations within GE and he'd kind of have them over for some kind of Friday night meal and get to know them. Clearly, if you were the person he was getting to know, you would be terrified by this prospect. He also took their partners along. Um, you may want to hire a well-spoken escort, however, um, or you may want to take your partner along. But that's gone now, let's get back to the book. So he mentioned with these things it fostered good communication because he understood how the ch communication channel worked and he believed that the channels remained open. And when he went to any meeting with the head of a state, you know, he was a very important chap because GE has huge amounts of cash behind it. Then what he did he, he, instead of saying what GE wanted, he'd ask what they needed. So what challenges are you facing? What's your biggest worry? What can we do to help you? And when you get promoted, just remember, you need to take that additional step up the ladder to see this new role as an opportunity to demonstrate the ability to lead change and collaborate with others. And Jeff found in his, in his career, there were three top qualities when evaluating leaders. They had to be open, honest, and focused. And GE, he actually described as a matrix within a matrix with no connection between leaders. And over time, bureau bureaucracy was rooted out with a few simple questions. So he'd in essence meet people and say, who do you work for? 
If the answer was more than one person, it's a bad sign. He claims you should only have one boss. I would disagree with that, what if your boss is ill, but nonetheless. Two, how are you measured? If workers didn't understand the metrics they were expected to live up to, it would be hard for them to succeed. People uh, should have no more than three or four measures in which they're trying to meet, because the metrics need to be clear and simple to understand. Finally, he'd ask, where do you live? Because if the person was responsible for, say, Africa, but lived in London or Dubai, that was a trouble sign. That's trouble in paradise. He believed that you needed to be uh, living close to where you work. Now, perhaps that's true for an organization such as GE, if you're head of that state. But I do believe remote work can be very useful. So, going back to this, a conglomerate with eight separate businesses. Actually, this contains eight types of every job, including top executive people. So potentially, they could learn from each other or they could compete with each other more directly to enhance productivity, employee effectiveness, and everything else. Just remember, every job does look easy until you're the one doing it. So what's the truth? Well, I'll give you an equation. Truth equals facts and context. The American leaders who came up in the 1980s, they were the first generation to really uh, have to deal with volatility and unexpected things actually happening. But now it's not unlikely that unlikely things will happen. It's the norm. Leaders of today have no choice really but to be crisis managers. And as a leader, you can't stop all bad things happening. But what you can do is avoid the avoidable things. When Jeff reflected back on his tenure at GE, which went on for 16 years, he actually said uncertainty was the word to summarize it. And it's interesting because his predecessor mentioned to him some advice, don't do anything that we can't control. Whereas towards the end of his time, he actually thought there's nothing that he can control. And best leaders must really stay ready and be able to adapt and absorb other people's fears. This is even more true with the latest events of the COVID pandemic. There's four types of people. One is always switched on, focused in meetings, equally good at making relevant points and listening to others. If you're listening to this, you're obviously in that type because you're taking notes and you're studying this in detail. There's two, talks too much, drown in the room in the kind of fine detail with leading, leaving minimal space for others to actually voice their views. There's the third, which tends to hang back and you may possess lots of valuable insights but um, they need encouragement to contribute. And there's the fourth, perhaps the worst type of person to have in your team. This is silent and smoldering. They may believe they're smarter than others, but they don't want to dirty their hands by debating. So they'll be the people who are an unnamed source. And if you worry about the fourth type of person, you'll, you'll never get anything done because you need intelligent people to serve as your guardrails, but in the end, it's your job to act. There's no simple rule for when to listen and when to act. In companies large and small, you must get rid of the people you don't trust, even those who are actually unusually talented. Just remember, your career is going to have good and bad days, but you need those bad days. Uh, the bad days are the things that will make you a better leader. I hope you found that useful. I'll see you next time.